Water-cooled SSD. Is it even worth it? Masonic is proud to announce our all-new Elite XG32OU gaming monitor. The XG32OU features a 4K 32-inch display with a 1 millisecond response time and 150Hz refresh rate and builds upon ViewSonic's revered Elite panel lineup. The ViewSonic Elite Series monitors feature clean aesthetic design that blend well with any setup, whether it be professional or personal, due to their sleek design and tasteful lighting. To learn more about ViewSonic's gaming monitors or to see their full lineup of monitors, click the link in the description below. So NVMEs, we, we know that if the controller gets too hot and the NAND gets too hot, it slows down, just like a CPU, it, it'll throttle. So motherboards have started implementing different kinds of cooler options in there. So if we look at my MSI board right here with my AMD uh, PCIe Gen 4, it's up to like 7,000 megabytes per second read-write on a PCIe Gen 4 SSD. You have these, uh, cool, these covers right here, which are designed with a heat pad to touch the SSD to give some sort of a heat spreader to try and keep it as cool as possible. Other brands have gone as far as including a heat spreader, like an actual heat sink with a synced design to try and improve cooling even more. So today I wanna to try a couple of different things. Oh, and then of course, Corsair and EK and other brands have even come out with blocks to put on your SSD to keep it as cool as possible. Uh, first and foremost, this is not a sponsored video by Corsair, even though this is a Corsair block that we're trying. I'm just genuinely curious. They sent us some of these blocks just with some of the um, HydroX stuff and I was like wondering if this is even necessary or not. So first we'll talk about the block and the way it attaches real quick. I did put together a loop which is sitting back here, which already has a block on it that I'll add to our SSD so we can do some AB comparison testing in terms of speed, because what we're looking for here is as temperature goes up, is speed and throughput on the drive gonna go down. And then I kinda wanna see like, with our base config, with this cover on here, is that adequate? I wanna take a fan and blow it out the cover, right? This is not a heat sink, it's just a, piece of metal they attach with a thermal pad. And then I wanna put the actual Corsair thing, heat sink, on the same drive. I'm not gonna change drives because that changes behavior, obviously. Uh, each NAND may perform a little different. But I wanna put the heat sink on there and then ultimately we're gonna put the water block on there. Because what this adds, is just an extra level of complication to a water cooling loop. It potentially adds another point of failure as well. So, but these, these little blocks right here are kind of neat. Like you could stick these on VRMs, you could stick them on memory, like for on the GPU or something and do some custom stuff if you wanted. The one thing I'm also curious about is how well they're gonna fit because now that we have much higher capacity drives, two terabyte, four terabyte, you're gonna have drives that have chips only on one side and you're gonna have drives that have chips on both sides, like this ADATA XPG drive here. So that's something I'm curious about. So, I mean, if we take a look at the block, already here, if I can do this with my fingernails off. It just clamps on with this guy right here. So you can see it's got a thermal pad to a copper plate. You can see the copper right there. So thermal pads already are not as efficient in transferring temperature as say like thermal paste is, but I'm just gonna use it the way it, it's designed to be. Now you have a thermal pad on the back side right here, but this does not make any real contact with this side. So if you had a double-sided SSD like this, I would be concerned about a cold side and a hot side. So the most important thing to cool, honestly, is the controller. Not the NAND itself, but the controller. So you can see the controller is on one side, which is right here. So that touching the block, obviously, is the most important piece. This will just uh, allow some sort of transfer of temperature away from it into this piece, but as long as you don't, have, if you don't have any airflow, then this will just heat soak as well. And then this attaches in the exact same manner, as you can see, they're probably even the same, yeah, they're even the same bottom piece right there. This just gives you an actual heat sink design, which is more efficient at radiating the heat away rather than a flat piece of metal like that. So <clears throat> our testing methodology here, we're learning that it's, there's not a lot of software out there yet that's designed to long-term stress test an SSD. I mean, we've got Crystal Mark, Crystal disk mark, you know, which will allow us to go up to 64, 64 gigabyte size file with a just straight sequential read write. But the problem is, how long does it take 64 gigabytes to copy at over 6,000 megabytes per second, right? 10 seconds. So we have the test running nine times. And what I end up having to do here is, and I'm, and I'm kind of skipping the, the small 
sequential read write, or we're just going with the large files because that's going to actually put the worst, uh, that's going to be the worst case scenario in terms of temperature. If it's just having to copy one big file and just move those bytes, that's faster than it doing kind of a random read write, which is kind of searching the drive. This is a, a, a harder, faster test. So as you can see right here, I'm setting this to 64 gigabytes per second. We're gonna be running this test nine times. Now I've gone in here and test, done the SSD mode and the standard default mode. I actually find the default mode puts a bigger stress on the drive and makes the temps go up more than the SSD mode itself. If we take a look right here, you can see on CPU mon uh, hardware monitor, SSD 980 Pro one terabyte. So this is a one terabyte NVMe 980 Pro, and this is the current temperature. The nice thing about the smart stuff on drives now is you can see the actual temperature, it does, re it does read out. So we're just idling right now at 30, 32C. So with no fan on here, just there's a little bit of ambient airflow because of the vents up there kind of blowing down. Not enough to really be considered active cooling in any way. So crystal disk mark, 64 gigabyte file. I'm only gonna do the sequential read, which is just the entire thing at once. Um, nine times, that's the max on the test that you can do. I really wish we could set this to like 100 times, that way it's essentially just a looping nonstop test. Um, but we're gonna have it, uh, we're gonna hit start here on just sequential read write. We've already gone up to 39C. And what we're kind of looking for here is where the temperature stops climbing. See, it's already five tests in on the nine. That's the thing that sucks about this is how long it takes, uh, or how short it does the duration versus how long it takes to create the file. Right is where we're gonna actually see like the biggest temperature increase. Cause reading is one thing, writing to the drive, that will put it under some serious stress. 4,901 megabytes per, per second write speed. Now you can see why PCIe Gen 4 is so nice. So rather than bore you guys with this, and please, for the love of God, comment in the comments down below if you know of a better test for this, something that is like Cinebench, but for your drive. See, all these tests that we found are like, how fast is your drive? Not, how hot does your drive get? Because I don't think that's something a lot of people think about, is how hot does my drive get? The only time we actually thought about it was when the Fury X LED, like RGB drive that we had, was completely locking up the system because we found that the lighting itself was heating the drive up to the point to where it was throttling down to nothing. That was the first time we even thought about the fact that SSDs could overheat and that could be a source of locking up in your system. We were getting blue screens and complete lockups on even just trying to get into the OS after the system was on for a while. And it, we did a whole video about that actually. And that's the, that's the scary thing is that, you know, these aren't things you really think about and it could be potential points of you know, issue on your system. Maybe what I should do is actually just remove the cooler. I think we should just remove the heat sink thing from the board, because that'll be the first thing to tell us if we're actually getting any benefit of that. And I can do it with the system running because this drive is held down with its own tab. The question is taking that off now. Oh, okay, I just hit, went from 46 to 50, just like that. I got a right speed. Yeah. Wow. Okay, if you've ever wondered if these things actually work, I mean, I know that there's been a lot of video discussions about whether or not these things actually work. Here's the thing, it's hot. If it's hot, it's working. It's taking on the heat, right? And clearly, spreading the heat across this, look at that, 59C, 61C, but look, we didn't lose any, we didn't lose any write speed, 63C? Read speed. Or read speed, sorry, yeah, read speed. We lost a lot of write. <laughs> Whoa, it came, that's weird. Hmm. At 66C, it's, that technically still has not slowed down. Just that one test could have been something anomalous with that one, but if you're if you're seeing higher temperatures, but it's not slowing down, um, that's not indicative of cooling not being necessary, because it then comes down to a longevity lifespan kind of a thing. Should be a fun test. I'm gonna reattach this in the middle of it going. I mean, so far this this speed fluctuation is kind of all within margin of error in terms of just the test. Look at how far that just dropped down to 48, 65 to 48, just like that. Okay, so I know that MSI, I think it was MSI that uh, Gamers Nexus was given a few years back a um, pretty hard time about these covers not doing a damn thing. And then they said, okay, we redesigned it, now they will. Clearly that worked. Nice uh, example right there of public pressure. Before we take that off, 
I want to push some air at that and see what happens. And I'm not even gonna have the speed of the fan running very fast. I'm just gonna, ah, ah. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. Temperatures are still coming down. We're pulling the temp down under load by just throwing a fan at that cover. The hardest way to test a cooler is to let something get fully saturated temperature wise and then increase the cooling to see if it can pull the temps down. It's a lot easier to keep the, the peak or the ceiling of the temperatures. Wow, there it goes again. I think this is something to do with the test more so than it being the actual temperature related drive or performance there. As I was starting to say, it's a lot easier to keep the temps from climbing really high if it has an adequate cooling from the start of the test versus letting it get above where the cooler wants it to be and then try and pull it down. That's a lot less efficient. This is not our OS drive too. That's also important to point out. This is a separate drive. So it should be getting us, you know, as fast as we can. Um, like if it was our OS drive, it'd probably be a little bit slower on the read speed just because it's also doing operating system stuff. Yeah, it looks like 42C is kind of our, that's 40. Yeah, that is, I don't understand what's causing that. Seeing some major fluctuations between write speed from test to test. See, look at that. It just jumped up to 4,000. Now it's at 5,000. <laughs> what? So clearly, the drive being cooler did help performance stay up. Let's do this now. I'm gonna shut down the system and I'm going to install the actual heat sink device versus the plate cooler here. Cause I wanna give you guys a real recommendation here. Like, should you take off these little covers and then run a heat sink like this? It may not be as pretty, but at the end of the day, if you're all about straight up performance, then obviously you should do what is gonna be best for the system in terms of speed. So installation should be pretty straightforward. So here's the drive. Yeah, the NAND's right here, the controller's right there, the cache is right here. Nothing on the back at all. Completely smooth, nothing back there but a sticker. So installation is pretty straightforward. Let's just make sure I'm not covering up my pins. So now that I've got the Corsair heatsink on here, our idle temperature is 2C lower already at 30C. And we're gonna start without the fan, the same test. And it'll probably take a solid uh, two or three times for it to reach its max temperature. The fan should be more effective on a heat sink than a flat piece of metal. I mean, a heat sink without fan or, or without air moving through it, it's a heat soak at that point, it needs to transfer the air or the heat to something, which is the air, which means it needs airflow. Typically in your case, you would have some sort of airflow going here. So our, our open air test bench without a fan blowing on, it's kind of the worst case scenario here. And it's still not like overheating. Our open air test bench without a fan blowing on, it's kind of the worst case scenario here. And it's still not like overheating. Back up to almost 5,000 on the right speed. So the test is clearly just kind of weird when it comes to right. I'm gonna do this test two more times and then we'll come back with the results after it's gotten proper uh, heat saturation in there. It's not 45C, it's not looking too different from the, the standard heat, you know, the little piece of metal here. I feel like without airflow going over that, it's almost worse than this because this is a bigger spread, a, a more thermal mass versus that. But now that it's done, let me put the fan on, let me let it cool it down, and then let's run the test again. 37C is where it's maxed out there. Somebody comment below why this is happening. Why from test to test, it like alternates between the 2000s and then the five or 4000s, 37C. So it's clearly not temperature related. This is just test related there. This may not have been the best piece of software for this type of comparison, but we are still getting some results at least, you know. This isn't some uh, deep dive as curious, like what's the, what's the layman's like reaction here to, hey, thing with fan, no thing, fan, block, go. Now it's time to do the water block. This might be the most ridiculous thing I've done in a while. <laughs> hey, well, ah. That's why you always leave the lids on, the caps on here. I might have, should have given myself a little more slack. I also shouldn't have put the drive in there backwards. Push it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a 240 millimeter radiator, <laughs> only cooling the thermal capacity. I mean, it's idling at 23C. 
Okay, so it's doing something. I feel like in terms of maintenance, this is just like the worst idea. Cause I mean, you could go like, you know, GPU to NVMe to somewhere, but I change drives kind of a lot. <laughs> so I don't, and I, and, and I have been using NVMe's for years now with just the, you know, the cooler covers that come with the motherboards. And I've never had an issue that stemmed from drive performance. So look, 29C under that test, still right in exactly where we were landing on speed. If we were gonna do this Mythbuster style, that means we have to find where the slowdown starts. It means we will find the point at which it slows down with the help of thermal power. I honestly expected maybe to see this number go up. This is, watch, the next test, we'll do it again real quick. That's gonna drop again to the 2000s probably, because that's, oops. That's what the test seems to do for some reason, like alternates, but our, our max temp was 30C. Our max temp was lower than our idle temp of our previous setup. So in terms of the water cooling, it's like, it's nothing more than just a flex, which is fine. I mean, this is flex tubing, so it's appropriate. But if you were just like, I wanna fill my system up with all the tubes and stuff that you can, well then you might as well get yourself water-cooled power supply. Yes, they do exist. Water-cooled SSDs, water-cooled graphics card, water-cooled CPU, and then just like all the distro plates and stuff that you can imagine and all the rads you can think of just to fill your case with water cooling. Until the first time you go to take a part out, and then you'll realize just how much that sucks. Like I said, we need to figure out at what temperature does the test start to uh, slow down. And we're gonna put the drive back without a cover and I'm just gonna start like slowly hitting it with a heat gun without melting the motherboard hopefully to artificially increase the temp and find where it starts to slow down. Right back to where we were, 67 degrees Celsius after the first test with no sort of heat sink or cooler on there. This is actually test two. I wanted to get saturated so we can make this faster. But the ironic thing about 68C is it still didn't slow down. We think right around 70 to 72C is where it might start to throttle based on what we saw with the Fury X. Remember that was a two and a half inch SSD. However, it's very similar internals. It still has a controller, it still has NAND and all that. Look at that. 70, 71, still absolutely no slowdown right here. <laughs> this is the weirdest thing, I didn't expect to be doing this today. Okay, I just also made the, ooh, okay, I made it the hottest temp that it can be. ADC, oh, oh, oh. yeah, Phil said I'm gonna burn a Samsung logo into my knuckle if I keep this up. There's 98C, okay, I'll stop right there. <laughs> If that doesn't throttle, it's still going 99.7%. I mean, it's still creating the test file, which is taking longer than it has before. <laughs> yeah, this It's is clearly throttled, clearly. 92. <laughs> we might have actually like overcooked it. We basically created like the turkey from National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation where they poke it and just, <laughs> yeah, we overcooked 1410. Dude, it can still do 1400 megabytes per second. Oh, dude, at 79, it went back up to full speed. No, you don't, oh no, 50. Okay, come on, 84. Oh, that right speed. <laughs> 138, 157 megabytes a second. Look, just by putting the fan on it, look how, how fast it's starting to bring the speed back up. Look at that. So yeah, look at that, 82C, it's at 5,300. So it's clearly throttled about 1,000 megabytes per second. Oh, look at that, 78 and it's up to full speed. So now having found where it starts to throttle, at least on read, we've got to see what write does. So it's at 81 now on read, and it's probably, it probably has gone slower than that now. This probably is still showing max speed, which I would like to see just say what was every test, but whatever, I need a better test for this. 4,544 at 79C. The four scenarios at which we tested here was with the motherboard cover, just the cover landed us in the low 40s, low to mid 40s, which is pretty impressive considering we see where it goes now without a cover. 67 to 72, depending on what the ambient's gonna be like. We then tested it with the 
heat sink on here, which without any airflow performed worse than the motherboard cover, but with airflow performed better than the motherboard cover. And the reason for that is just the thermal mass. This is a bigger chunk of metal. It has more thermal capacity than the heat sink, but the heat sink is about efficiency. It's about taking the heat and having more surface area through all those fins to transfer that heat to the air when air is flowing over it. So you have to have air flowing over it. The water block, just a pure flex. I mean, yeah, it obviously, it obviously kept it the coldest, but as you could see, it didn't make a difference to performance whatsoever. So is it necessary? Absolutely, positively not under any circumstance. Technically, neither is this or this if you have any sort of airflow going over your drive. It's dropped down to 44 right now with the fan just pointing at it. Obviously it's not doing a test right now. So our recommendation here honestly is just use the motherboard cover if it actually has a heat sink uh, or it actually has a thermal pad touching this and is making solid contact with your drive. And you'll find that you're not gonna throttle. Now every controller is different. You have, you have Fizon controllers. And I'm not gonna go through all the brands, but you have a bunch of different brands of controllers and they're all are gonna have their tolerances in terms of heat. But what we've seen right here was that the NVMe Gen 4, specifically found in the Samsung drive, it was like 78 to 80 C before we started to see any significant slowdown. And here's the thing, 6,600 to 5,700 or so, about a thousand megabytes per second, you wouldn't necessarily notice that in your day-to-day -day usage. And this is also the worst case scenario where we are moving a 64 gigabyte file constantly where you have a lot of sporadic things happening with your system, it's not gonna be under that much load. But I think at the end of the day, I'm just actually kind of shocked at how well the stock cover did on this particular drive. Now, one thing to keep in mind is there are different size coolers. So for instance, I don't know how well you can see it on here. This cooler is significantly bigger than the one above it. So that could absolutely have an effect on the temperature. But I think if you're using the stock co covers that come on just about every modern motherboard these days, and you have airflow moving over it, some sort of airflow, whether it be a fan case flow or whatever, or maybe even make, make a cover, like a fan that blows directly on it, you'll have longevity in your drive. The temps will be perfectly fine in terms of throttling. If it's not throttling, it doesn't think it's too hot. So you know you're within spec and parameter of that. I honestly expected it to throttle sooner and I was hoping that by keeping it as cold as possible with the water cooler, that that meant that we would get near that 7,000 megabytes per second, which is advertised. That just goes to show until the initial throttling starts, there's no curve. There's no speed curve like a, like a, like a, so CPUs and graphics cards, they'll fluctuate that speed, that megahertz based on the temperature curve. This doesn't have any curve at all. It goes full speed until it sees throttling and then it adjusts itself based on temperature. So anyway, this might be a dumb moment for many of you, but this is something I've never actually tested and I wanted to, to see how it goes. Have you guys noticed any uh, issues with your SSDs temperature wise and stuff? If you didn't know, hardware monitor can actually show you the temperatures of both your hard drives and your SSDs. I recommend looking at that. So you guys can have an idea. Are your drives overheating? You may not know. Some people aren't using the thermal pads on those covers. So then what you're doing is you're insulating the drive away from any heat or airflow, and then you could be creating a problem for your drive and you may not even know it. So download some sort of a monitor tool, at least look at your temperatures and make sure everything is working as expected. I expect you guys to also give this video a like if you appreciated it and subscribe if you're not. It actually greatly helps the channel and we'd love to see all your beautiful smiling comments down below. Thanks for watching, we'll see you in the next one. Oh, and by the way, I don't use Telegram. Don't be an idiot.